Somewhere right now, there's a woman somewhere having her period, and she doesn't have access to the products that she needs. Looking about the room today, I'd say there's about a thousand women in here, and I think it's fair to say that we can all access the products that we choose to use. Women bleed, and we don't seem to be able to talk about it. Mention periods, heavy periods, painful periods, awkward periods, and the conversation can get a little awkward when you're out in company. Advertising depicts us all as rollerblading goddesses when it's that time of the month. <laughs> We've got tampons and pads that don't make any noise at all. And think about it, when you watch TV, do you ever, ever hear anyone mention having a really, really bad period? I mean, when was the last time you heard Stacey Slater ask for a tampon in the Queen Vic? <laughs> exactly. It doesn't happen. What I learned recently is that one in five women in Scotland have went without period products. And it's been for a variety of different reasons. Sometimes it's been about money. Sometimes it's been about having other mouths to feed and not putting your own needs first. There's a massive stigma when it, comes, when, it, when it comes towards having a visible period in public too. Back in 2016, I was a mature student and I was um, researching period poverty. And the one thing that I took away from the course was that research is the biggest tool you can use if you're trying to make a change in the world. And my lecturer used to always go on about facts and evidence being weapons when you're trying to create a change for good. I started looking into period poverty more and more. There was reports in the news about girls missing school. There was reports about women and girls using rags, socks, newspapers, because they were faced with no other choice. Could you imagine how that must feel if that was the only choice that you had to make? I really hope none of us in this room ever have to make that choice. So I started thinking to myself, what could I do about it? There was a lot of noise in Scotland. People were chatting about it. People were talking about it in Parliament. There was food banks making desperate cries and pleas for donations of period products. I started researching it more and more and looking into unpacking this this situation and trying to find out just how deep the problem, the problem ran. But what I found out was that there wasn't a lot of academic literature um, to kind of shine a light on the issue. Yes, there was schemes and strategies in faraway countries to keep young women in education at that time of their periods, but there wasn't really a lot of evidence and facts about what was going on right here, right now, in, in our community and down the street from us too. Right there and then, I knew what I had to do. So I bounded into uni, sat down, and I told my lecturer my big grand plans about what I was going to do. I said to her, I'm going to research this subject, and I'm going to create evidence. I'm going to go out, and I'm going to get the lived-in experience of women and girls in Scotland, and I'm going to tell that story. She sat back, and she looked at me. There was a little bit of skepticism in there. And she said to me, Victoria, tell me, just exactly what are you trying to achieve? And I said, oh, that's easy. I want to achieve three things. I want universal access to products. That would be good. I want a change in education. That would be really nice. We need that. But then I actually want a national conversation about menstruation. I think it's time that we had that conversation. She sat back and she looked at me. She looked me up and down. And she politely said to me, I think your time would be better spent focusing on trying to pass this course. <laughs> and she wasn't wrong. But I said to her, look, don't worry. I'll do it in my spare time. My lecturer was sitting back, a doctor of science with lots of letters after her name, listening to this undergraduate who'd recently failed a course saying, I'm going to change the world. I know what I'm going to do. So I ran away and I got to work started planning this research study, got a little bit lost in it. It was all prepped and all ready and all live to go. It was on the 28th of April last year. 
It was all ready to go out on the internet, and I was really nervous, so I went for a glass of wine to calm my nerves. That turned into a bottle of wine. My phone ran out of battery because I was checking it so much just to find out what the reaction was going to be like. When I got up the road and I got home, I turned on my phone and I was blown away. Free Period Scotland had went live on Twitter. The reaction was going around the world. I was getting messages from Ireland to Australia, but women in Scotland were taking this survey. Over that weekend, 400 women took that survey. The numbers continued to climb. 500, 600, 700. The final total stood at 1,013 people. I had my evidence base. But that's when the real work began. So I locked myself away and I taught myself how to thematically code, draw insights, key themes, and how to analyze this mountain of data that I was sitting on. It was really overwhelming. I realized that I was sitting on this, such a big mountain of data that had never actually been captured in this way before. I would sit in my living room at night with love heart post-it notes and I'd scroll with the themes that popped out. Gender, poverty, stigma, shame. The themes were so overwhelming. I cried. I cried for the woman with endometriosis who stays in every month when she has her period because she's so scared about leaking through her clothes. I cried for the woman at university who has to choose between eating and buying period products every month. I cried for the woman who shoplifts tampons every month, not because she doesn't have any money, but because her partner withholds these products against her as a form of abuse and control. Stigma and shame, stigma and shame, over and over and over again. Stigma and shame is man-made. It's created, it's reinforced again in language, advertising, culture. All of us in here are complicit in the stigma and shame of women and girls having their periods. I think it's time. I think it's time to go beyond period poverty. I think it's time to raise the expectations of women, girls, and people that menstruate. I think it's time we started talking about menstrual justice. In fact, I think it's time we all started rollerblading towards menstrual justice. <laughs> Visibility is a key when it comes to tackling stigma and shame. It's powerful and we can all use it. I think today we need to start going forward with that message and it's time to start talking about it. Thanks. <laughs>